Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it is my pleasure to uh, um, welcome Borzo Bonaktarpour. He is from Michigan State University and is working on um, automated uh, revision of real-time programs. We met him, I met him last year at uh, a real-time system symposium where I had an interesting chat about possibly also applying these kind of techniques to, to, a, to a larger um, realm of, of possible programs besides just real time. And today he's going to talk about uh, automated revision of distributed and real time programs. So let us so give uh, my give the voice to him. Okay, so um, thank you for the introduction. Um, um, I'm going to present um, a highlight of uh, some of the work that I have been doing in the past uh, few years on um, automating the revision of distributed and real-time programs, which is a joint work with uh, Sandeep Kulkarni. So um, what I mean by automated revision, it goes back to the notion of program synthesis. And uh, um, so I'm going to describe a little bit of uh, uh, history of program synthesis uh, which was, you know, started uh, by the seminal work of Emerson and Clark in '82, uh, where they introduced the synthesis method f to generate synchronization skeleton of programs from CTL specifications. Um, and then over time, synthesis methods, uh, I mean, synthesis techniques, range from, um, you know, controller synthesis methods to automated theoretic synthesis and to, you know, synthesizing real-time um, programs. Um, However, this, the, the, the work that I just mentioned, they start synthesizing systems from uh, specification. Alternatively, um, in, a, in a paper in 2000, uh, Kulkarni and Aurora, they introduced a method to start synthesizing programs uh, from another program and the specification. Um, specifically, what they did was to add fault tolerance to fault intolerant programs in, in the context of untimed distributed programs. And then in uh, 2005, we generalized that theory to um, the theory of automated revision of any sort of program, not just you know, adding fault tolerance. So this is uh, what I mean by the notion of uh, program revision. Uh, suppose we have, uh, we are given a program and a property to a model checker. And the model checker um, generates a counterexample. Now this counterexample could be due to the change of environment of the program because the program is now exposed to a, to a new set of faults. It could be due to um, a mistake in the program design or it could be due to uh, you know, incomplete specification because you know, later, which, which happens quite often in, in software life cycle. So, now, a natural question to ask is whether it is possible to revise the program with respect to the failed property such that the generated program satisfies that property while it keeps, uh, wh while it, uh, you know, continues to satisfy its existing property. So this is the essence of the problem that we are addressing in this research. Um, so I'm going to show you a, a toy example based on um, a story that I heard on NPR about an accident that happened in Colorado uh, a, a couple of years ago. So um, the, the story is as follows. Um, in an intersection, um, there, uh, th there, there were two traffic lights that were both green at the same time, uh, which is not acceptable in any intersection. Um, and then a, a school kid didn't pay attention to that, and then a, drive, and a driver runs over the school kid. So um, that motivated me to build up a scenario that, you know, uh, how such a thing could happen. Now, um, let's imagine that we have a one-lane bridge. 
Uh, I just simplified that scenario. Let's imagine we have a one-lane one bridge, uh, which is controlled by two traffic lights um, at the two end of the bridge. Uh, so we have traffic signal one and traffic signal two. Um, initially, the first one is uh, green, the second one is red. Uh, and now I'm going to develop a program that controls this, uh, these traffic signals. So here are the program actions uh, in, in the form of uh, Dijkstra's guided commands. So, um, looking for my pointer. So, um, let's imagine that uh, the first signal is green, and the timer that changes the phase of the signal to yellow uh, is somewhere between. Thank you. Oh, this is. Is. Uh, between 1 and 10, any time between 1 and 10, it can change to yellow and then uh, reset the timer that is in charge of controlling uh, the yellow signal. So once the signal is in yellow um, and the timer is uh, any time between 1 and 2, it resets clock Z1 and it changes phase to red. Now once uh, this signal is red, which is sig1, and the timer of the other signal is uh, less than 1, uh, it can, the other one can go to yellow, right? So this means that it's anywhere between, like for example, green, so x1 is this timer? Yeah. So if it's anywhere in between 1 and 10, it can go to yellow? Yeah, right. And then once it, uh, it's in yellow state, any time between 1 and 2, it can go to red. Okay. And once this one is red, the other one can wait uh, any time, uh, maximum one second or you know, one minute, whatever, and so then that, that means go to green. It can go to yellow basically immediately. It goes to Not immediately, to yellow. One second. It can, yeah, it should wait at least for one second or for one minute, let's say. Uh, but it can happen any time between 1 and 10. So this is not a perfect. Um, uh, so it's a non deterministic. Uh, yes, line. yes. Okay. I mean, the determinism is between 1 and 10, yeah. uh, but it can happen any time between that. Uh, but that doesn't affect the incorrectness of the program. Um, so, you know, we can capture the specification of the, this program by a set of transitions where uh, both signals are not read in the target state. Okay? That means if one of them is green and the other one is yellow, then cars can go in both directions and there, there will be an accident, right? So this is a very simple specification. And if we run this program um, as it is, it never violates this specification. It never reaches a state where both signals are not read. Now, uh, as we all know, it is, it is almost impossible to identify all the faults, all the vulnerabilities, and all the you know, requirements of a program at design time. So there are always issues about fault tolerance, about the time predictability and security, uh, which are not captured at design time. So one such uh, scenario could be the occurrence of this fault. At any state, uh, clock Z2 gets reset, and it doesn't do anything else, right? Due to a circuit problem, one of the clocks gets reset. In, in particular, clock Z2. So let's see what happens. Suppose we are in this state where both signals are red. And uh, Z1 is uh, less than or equal to 1, and Z2 is greater than 1. right? So if we go back to the program, the only possible action is signal 2 changes phase to green, right? because uh, this one is greater than 1. However, if this fault occurs, Z2 gets reset, and now both clocks are less than or equal to 1, right? So now signal 1 can go to green, signal 2 can go to green too, based on the program that I just showed in the previous slide. So as you can see, a simple fault, which is a clock reset fault, which, happens, which could happen quite often in any circuit, can lead us to a disastrous state, right? 
Now, if you look at this program, you know, we'll, uh, we'll figure out, we'll realize that uh, the program is almost correct. However, in the absence of this fault, it uh, you know, exhibits some computations, some behaviors which, uh, which, is, which are not acceptable. So the question here to ask is whether it is possible to revise this program um, in an automated fashion such that you know, we can add fault tolerance to, to this program. And this is one, another aspect of uh, the research that we've been doing. So the criteria of uh, uh, how we conduct this research is as follows. First of all, we only focus on interesting properties. Our synthesis methods do not uh, address any arbitrary specification. We only focus on properties that are typically used in, in specifying programs, um, such as the Unity programs um, introduced by Chandri and, Chandi and Misra. Uh, the second criterion is um, we want to identify the cases where synthesis is feasible um, in terms of time and space. And uh, we also you know, address uh, 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 programs in the context of real-time, distributed, and centralized, um, untimed, uh, all possible cases. And uh, we also consider both closed and open systems, where in closed systems the program does not interact with the environment, where, whereas in open systems the uh, program does interact with the, with the envir environment. So this is going to be the outline of the rest of my talk. Um, first I will um, talk about addition of unity properties. Um, in particular, I will focus on just one property because that's the most interesting one. It's a liveness property. And then I will uh, um, introduce the notion of uh, addition of fault tolerance to distributed programs, um, uh, which is in the context of open systems. Um, and in particular, I'll, sh I'll describe some of our, our symbolic synthesis algorithms and um, uh, I'll, I'll uh, elaborate on some of the experimental results. So let's get into the unity properties. Uh, one of them is the well-known leads to property, uh, which can be described with this you know, LTL formula, uh, in which it is always the case that if P becomes true, then Q should eventually become true. Um, it's uh, of this sort of computation where P becomes true here and it, Q eventually should become true. Now the question is, if we have a program, which we know from a model checker that it does not satisfy this property, it does not satisfy this liveness property, um, can we revise the program such that the, the generated program satisfies this property? This is like a, you know, a mutual exclusion algorithm that under some conditions um, does not, sa I mean, um, some of the processes under some conditions starve before the critical section, right? And the question is if we can, uh, you know, give this algorithm, mutual exclusion algorithm to another program to, to fix it for us. So let's assume, uh, let's consider this state space, which, which is the big box uh, denoted by SP. And we have two state predicates, P and Q. Um, and now let's consider the cases where things can go wrong uh, in terms of a leads to property, right? The first case is the existence of deadlock states. So if we have a computation that starts from S0, go to, goes to S1, and then reaches where P is true, and then goes to a black hole where Q is not reachable, then this is one case that um, the leads to property can, uh, can be violated, right? So a very simple um, way to resolve this problem is basically to remove this transition. Because S2 would become unreachable, that means it never becomes true, and we never you know, get trapped in this black hole, right? So the simple solution to this problem is if we have a deadlock state that is reachable from a state from P, make that P state unreachable. You know, very simple. The second case that the least to property can be violated is the existence of cycles, right? So let's imagine that uh, a computation starts from S0, goes to S1, where P becomes true, and then we have this cycle, right, which can reach Q, but when we have this cycle, it means the program exhibits the computations where infinite computations that starts from S0, and then it goes to this cycle, you know, in, uh, for, you know, infinite, uh, infinite times. So, um, so, so uh, 
but uh, doesn't this still imply that eventually it will, it will go to Q if it is like non deterministic choice? Then some yes, somewhere, some, sometime sure. very far in the future, it must go to Q. No, it doesn't have to go to Q because when once it at, once it is at S two a computation, it always has the choice to go to Q or go to S three, right? So the program has both computations. It has computations that it eventually goes to Q, and it also has the computations that it always goes to this, go to this cycle. Yeah, right? I was just wondering how this is viewed, whether like in infinity we will go to Q and it, 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 it's a valid thing or, or not. So, um, you know, the, the set of computations, I mean program... Yeah, going to infinity, the probability of not going to Q goes to zero. So. Sort of related to fairness, whether you assume that all the all the actions are taken at some point or not. Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Right. If you don't have any fairness condition uh, at any time at S two, right, um, you have the choice to go to Q or you have the choice to continue on this loop, right. So uh, a very simple way to resolve this problem is to break this cycle. Right? And the, again, the easiest way to do that is to remove the transition S2 to S3. So if we remove this, we basically, when we reach S2, we have to go to Q. There's no other choice. So you know, this is a very simple algorithm uh, that addresses the issue of deadlock states, and it addresses the issue of cycles, uh, which are basically two um, problems that can violate a leads to property. Now, this, this could still be solved by just not going to S1, right? Like with the previous uh, solution. Uh, yes, but that, that's, that's, that's correct. But we, I mean, one of, one of our goals is to synthesize programs that have sort of maximum non-determinism. Because we want to keep the computations you know, as much as we can. Although this method as it is, this does not satisfy maximum non-determinism. And in fact, I was going to show in the next slide some other, um, uh, let's say, counterintuitive uh, results. So I just showed that if we have a list of property, we can synthesize a program uh, in polynomial time, which is sound and complete. Right? The algorithm is sound and complete. However, if we want to add list to property by preserving maximum non-determinism, which, which, uh, which I mean um, by keeping maximum number of transitions in the program, then the problem is hard. We can't do that in, in polynomial time. Now, a more counterintuitive result is, um, which, which took me about a year to convince myself that this might be a hard problem, is let's forget about the least to property. Let's just say we I mean, we have this leads to property of true goes to Q and true goes to T, which are basically two eventually properties, right? This is eventually Q, this one is eventually T, right? And we want to make sure that uh, starting from any state in the program, we always visit Q and visit T, right? So, you know, uh, my intuition was this, the problem should be easy to solve. But it turns out that this problem is NP-complete to solve because it is, um, equal to the problem of finding a cycle in the program that contains two vertices in a graph. And that, 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 that problem is NP-complete. So even though the, you know, we have imposed a lot of restrictions to, the, to our problem setting, some problems are still hard to solve. Um, and I think you know, this, this work has some applications in the Terminator project at MSR. So let me switch to additional fault tolerance to fault intolerant programs. I'm going to start with uh, one of the very well-known examples in distributed computing, which is the Byzantine agreement uh, problem by uh, Leslie Lamport, uh, who is at MSR, uh, Shostak, and Pease. So in the Byzantine agreement problem, we have a general, and we have a set of non-generals. Uh, the general has a decision variable, which we denoted by dg, which could be either 0 or 1. The non-generals also have uh, this decision, decision variables, uh, dj, dk, and dl, uh, which, whose domain is 0, 1, and bottom, which denotes an undecided process. 
Uh, they also have variable f, which shows that whether that non-general has finalized its decision, which can be either false or true, right? So what happens is uh, the general sends a message to the non-generals and tells them what the decision is. So a program that can uh, model this problem is as follows. This action where uh, when process J is undecided, process and process J is, has not finalized this decision, it can copy the value from the general, right? Very easy. And then subsequently, when it is not undecided anymore and has not finalized, it can go ahead and finalize this decision, right? So let's see what can go wrong. Uh, the general can become Byzantine, and it can start uh, lying, right, or changing its decision. So the variable BG shows that um, this, this process is Byzantine. Uh, the same thing for non-general processes. Um, now, a fault action is as follows. Uh, we are considering a, a canonical version of the Byzantine generals problem. Um, if all the processes are non-Byzantine, then at most one of them can become Byzantine, right? And once it becomes Byzantine, it can, changes, it can change its decision. From 0 to 1, 1 to 0, any arbit I mean, arbitrarily it can change its decision. Now, what, let's see what the safety specification is here. Um, we have agreement, which basically says if we have two non-general, non-Byzantine processes, and uh, th then uh, if they have finalized this, their decision, their decision must agree, right? And validity says uh, if the general is non-Byzantine, then any finalized process should agree with the general. Now, the fact is, the program that I just showed you in the presence of the faults that I just showed you um, does, not, does not meet this safety specification. Now, let's consider this scenario. Um, first, the general has decision one, and it is not Byzantine. Then the fault occurs, and uh, then the process K uh, comes along. It copies the value from the general. It is both are one, and finali finalizes its decision. Then, uh, process, uh, the, the general process becomes Byzantine. It changes its decision from, zero, from one to zero, right? Then process J comes along and it copies the new value and finalizes, right? So this means we have two non-generals, K and J, who are both finalized, but with different decisions. This is a violation of the specification. And the interesting thing is the fault occurred here, but what actually violated the safety specification was a program action, not a fault. So this suggests two things. First of all, faults by themselves are not bad, right? A fault action could occur, but it doesn't necessarily violate the safety specification. The other thing is if, when a fault occurs, then it means sometimes, in, at, uh, uh, you know, under some conditions, a program action can subsequently violate the safety specification. So let me introduce the basic concepts um, uh, on you know, how we specify, uh, I mean, uh, about our framework. Uh, we have a set of Boolean variables. Um, you know, they could be integers that are modeled by a set of Booleans. That's fine. So we are not restricted to Boolean variables. Um, a state is a conjunction of the value of uh, each variable. Um, a state predicate is ba basically um, a set of states. A transition is um, uh, a pair of states from S to S prime, where S prime contains all the prime variables. You know, these are the common practices in, you know, in, in model checking too. Um, a transition predicate is basically a set of transitions. Uh, a program is basically a, a transition predicate. Uh, you know, we model programs by just a set of transitions. Um, the idea of fault tolerance is based on the notion of closure and convergence. Um, closure means um, we say that the state predicate is closed in program P if uh, starting from any state in S, uh, the transition uh, ends in S as well, right? So that means um, if we execute the transitions in P, by starting from S, we never leave P. It is always closed. 
Uh, computation of P is a sequence of states where any two consecutive states are a transition in P. Um, safety specification in, in our framework, we model them by a set of bad transitions, right? So in case of the traffic controller, the, a bad transition was a transition that ends in a state where um, both signals were not read, right? Um, this might seem quite restrictive to, um, to, 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 to model a safety specification by only a set of transitions. Because in the Alpern and Schneider framework, you know, it can be a set of bad prefixes, right? But uh, you know, we showed that if we consider bad pairs of transitions, that then the, the synthesis problem becomes NP-complete. Uh, it doesn't mean that you know, we cannot always um, uh, develop uh, you know, efficient heuristics, but uh, I think we are still not there. I mean, there are still a lot of problems even in this framework to address, to um, consider more, uh, before we consider, you know, harder problems. So I'm going to abuse a little bit of notation. Um, so satisfaction, uh, we say that the program satisfies spec if any computation of P does not contain a transition in spec. It doesn't contain any transition, uh, uh, any of those bad transitions, right? Um, uh, I just did that to introduce less notation. Uh, because when, when, when we say it satisfies spec, it means it should be in spec. But what I mean here is we say it, it satisfies spec if it does not have a bad transition in spec. Um, so the, fir and the first condition is um, uh, by starting from S, S should be closed in P, right? So starting from a state predicate, the program does not uh, leave that st state predicate, and it never contains a bad transition, right? So in case of the traffic controller or the Byzantine agreement program, if we start from the, 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 the program invariant, uh, we never violate the safety, uh, safety specification. Uh, and what I mean by the invariant if, is um, if a program satisfies its, its uh, specification from by starting from a state predicate, and that that state predicate is um, non-empty, then it can be one invariant of the program. Uh, projection of transition predicate P on uh, state predicate S is the set of program transitions that start and end in S. I'm done by my notation, so. Let's see what faults are. They are basically um, a set of transitions, right? Fault span is the set of states that are reachable by both program and fault transitions, right? It's the set of all states that the program can reach in the presence of faults. So by starting from the invariant. So the fault span is always a superset of the invariant and it is closed in uh, program transitions in the presence of faults, okay? So I think this, uh, this, this uh, figure shows what I mean by, uh, suppose this is our finite state space. Uh, this is the invariant. Um, if uh, a program transition starts in the invariant, it always stays in the invariant. There could be fault transitions that start and end in the, in the invariant, but um, what we are more interested in are fault transitions that start from the invariant and takes the program outside the invariant. And it can reach uh, up to but not beyond to this state predicate, uh, which is called the fault span. Okay? So, can you prove that the state base is finite? I mean, in the setting it is because your, your state variables were Booleans and you have a finite number of them. Yeah. Things were represented in terms of them, but still. But you could, I mean, does it really matter? Um, well, then, so in, 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 the, in the next couple of slides, I'll show some, uh, you know, uh, I'll show that our synthesis algorithms involve some fixed point computations. And if we have infinite uh, state space, we have to show that we always reach a fixed point. Whereas when we are in finite states, you know, we always reach a fixed point. There is no you know, undecidability issues. Um, if your question is, um, if those fixed point computations are, I mean, if 
we, are, we can always reach those fixed points. Uh, right now, I don't know. Yeah, my, my question was more of a sort of a foundational nature, sort of like the basic setting. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, one is the algorithmic part of it, and then the sort of theoretical part. So you present it up to now, so what you give you sort of the basic framework. Right. And in that context, I don't think there are quite. Yeah, in, in the context of the framework, yeah, every, I mean, we, we, could, we could deal with um, an infinite state space. Or ex actually executing and doing algorithm. Exactly. Now, in terms of the algorithm, which I'm going to present shortly, um, uh, if we are dealing with an infinite state space, then we have to show that, you know, these fixed points are, are, are um, uh, you know, we don't run to any undecidability issues. So, the... This is the definition of what we mean by fault tolerance. Suppose we are given a program P, which is a set of transitions, a set F of faults, which is also a set of transitions, and a set of bad transitions, which are in spec, and the state predicate S, which is the program invariant. We say that uh, P is F tolerant to spec from S if or if and only if. Um, the first condition says that P satisfies spec from S, which means the given intolerant program in the absence of faults never violates the safety specification by starting from the invariant. Okay? So we are always assuming that the given program is correct in the absence of faults. The second condition captures the correctness of the program in the presence of faults. So we say that the, there should exist uh, a state predicate T, uh, which is the fault span. And the program in the presence of faults should never violate the safety specification. So that means if a fault occurs here, like this, the program never violates the safety specification in the, in the presence of faults. Moreover, we require that starting from the fault span, any computation of P should again reach uh, the invariant, which is the notion of recovery. So a fault occurs, the program goes outside the invariant, uh, it should never violate the safety specification, and implicitly it should satisfy all of its liveness specifications. Uh, and the way we do it is we guarantee that by starting from any state in the fault span, there is always a computation that reaches uh, the invariant in the finite number of steps. Okay. So now I'm going to show how we basically synthesize a program that uh, satisfies all the requirements of this definition. This is, a, this is our problem. This is our um, synthesis problem. So we are given a program P with invariant S, a set of faults F, bad transition in spec, and we want to identify program P prime with invariant S prime such that the first condition is the invariant of the synthesized program should be a subset of the original program. So we are restricting introdu introducing new states to the program. In other words, um, we do not allow addition of new variables to the program. Anything should be done inside the current state space of the program, right? And the interesting thing is, you know, even by imposing all these restrictions, uh, you know, the problem is still not very easy to solve. The second condition is um, the set of transitions of the synthesized program that start and end in the invariant should be a subset of the set of transitions of the the original program that start and end in, in the invariant. So that means, that basically means uh, we are not adding new transitions inside the program invariant. Uh, let me give you uh, an intuition of, you know, why we are doing this. Um, this is basically because we don't want to add new behaviors to the program in the presence of, in the absence of faults, right? Because if we add new behaviors, um, we cannot guarantee that the program continues to, sat to satisfy its existing specification, the existing specification of the intolerant program, right? So all we can do 
based on these two conditions inside the invariant is we can either remove a state right or we can eat or we can remove a transition and the third condition is uh, of course that uh, the synthesized program should be fault tolerant with respect to spec and s prime which is the definition that I gave in the previous slide um, so I'm not going to describe how we address the notion of distribution um, for instance the Byzantine Icarian program was a distributed program because um, for instance a non-general process cannot read the B value of uh, you know a general process because if the non-general knows that the general is Byzantine then the we can synthesize the very you know simple program that says if the general is Byzantine don't listen to it right so some of the variables are not readable some of the variables are, are not writable by the processes so we have to introduce the notion of process uh, <clears throat> which means you know a program consists of a set of processes and each process is um, identified by a set of variable um, a transition predicate which says you know how how the process um, gets executed um, a set of variables that the process can read and a set of variables that the process can write okay um, this is how we model the write restrictions of uh, a process suppose we have this transition where a and b are true in the source state and the value of A is changed in the target state. Now if A is not in the set of variables that J can write, the program is not allowed to take this transition because the program is not allowed to write the variable A. Okay, So um, the, the, the write restrictions can basically be modeled by a set of transitions that uh, change the value of a variable uh, that is not allowed to, to write. So why is uh, read subset to write? Yes. We do not allow blind writes. A process can only write a variable if it can read it. And um, so you might ask that if I send a message in a distributed system, I'm basically changing the value of some other variable in some other process without reading it. And this model doesn't capture that. And I can't agree more. But at the same time, I obviously see that if we don't impose this restriction, we go to a higher class of complexity. So what, is, what are the practical implications of this? The practical implication is um, we are in shared memory model. We are not in message passing. Although we can model some of the message passing problems um, in the shared memory mod model as well. Um, for instance, you know, we have synthesized um, uh, the, the ver uh, a version of the alternating bit protocol, which is a you know, network protocol, which is you know, a message passing protocol. And even Byzantine agreement problem in the, in the original problem by Lamport, the, the problem is in message passing um, model. But you know, we made some modifications to model it in, in shared memory. model them as abstract state machines so that's right that's one way of, of sort of um, sort of gives you a shared memory model that's right rigorous right so the read restrictions are not as as nice as the write restrictions now let's imagine we have a transition in the source state a is not true a is false and b is false and in the target state uh, a has changed to true and B is false and let's imagine the uh, let's uh, consider the case where the process J cannot read the variable the variable B all right now this transition where B is false in the source and target states is identical to this transition where B is true in the source and target states from the eyes of process J because it cannot read B right so as you can see the value of A is the same in the source states and they are the same in the target states right 
and the value of B is equal in the source and target state of the first transition and in the source and target states of the second transition. Now, process J cannot distinguish these two transitions because it basically cannot read B, right? So any transition um, is now associated with basically a group of transitions. Any transition that we take in, in a distributed program is associated with a group of transitions. So if we want to remove a transition in, in our synthesis algorithms, we have to remove the entire group. If we want to add a transition, we have to add its entire group, right? So the, the first part of a group is basically, uh, I don't want to go through all the details of this formula, but it, it, it basically says that the value of the variables that the process can read, such as A, uh, in all the source states of the transitions in that group and all the target states must, must be the same, such as A here. And the second condition says uh, for the variables that the process cannot read, right, they should be the same in the source and target states of uh, each transition, such as not B, not B, and here B, B. Okay? And this is actually the source of most of the complications and most of the time complexity that we'll observe in the experimental results. Ide identifying the groups, computing the groups, remove them, add them. So let me get into the heuristics. Um, now, our goal is to synthesize a program P prime with invariant S prime from uh, the given intolerance program. So the first step is uh, identifying the state predicate MS from where faults can, faults alone violate the safety specification, right? And then we'll remove that set of states from the invariant of the program. So this is very easy to do. It's a you know, simple fixed point computation. Uh, suppose this is uh, the set of states that can re be reached by the bad transitions, right? So um, this is the first iteration. Then we'll see what uh, fault transitions can, can reach this state. And then we expand it. And we continue doing this until we reach a fixed point, right? So these are the set of states from where faults alone violate the safety specification. And th uh, the reason that I'm emphasizing on faults alone is it's because we, ha uh, I mean, a program does not have control over the occurrence of faults. So if a program transition reaches MS, that means from there, you know, the, the whole system is on its own because, you know, all these faults can happen which the program does not have control on them, and then the safety specification will be violated. So we basically remove MS from uh, the, the program invariant, and we remove all the incoming program transitions. Then anything that we do during our heuristics, we have to compute, recompute the fault span, right? And that's very easy to do. It's another reachability analysis problem. We start from the invariant. Um, the next, the first step is computing the set of uh, states that are reachable by faults because they are not reachable by uh, program transitions. And then from there, there could be other, other fault transitions or other program transitions. So we keep doing this uh, until we reach a fixed point, right? Then uh, we identify the transitions in the intolerant program that can be used in the tolerant program, which basically means um, if there are transitions in the fault span, that uh, program transitions, that violate the safety specification, like the, the one that I showed in the Byzantine agreement problem, um, then we have to remove them. And we, 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 we basically have to remove its corresponding group. Okay? So once we do that, we again have to recompute the fault span because we remove some of the transitions. That means some of the states in the fault span are not reachable anymore. Now, one thing that I want to emphasize on is this sort of recomputation does not occur in model checking, right? In model checking, we compute the whole set of reachable states, and that's it. We just want to verify you know, something. Whereas in program synthesis, um, a lot of time is spending for this sort of you know, recomputation of state predicates or transitions. So you know, there, there could be other, um, let's say, you know, more efficient ways to compute the fault span. And the experiment results that I'm going to show is the non-efficient ones. For instance, when we have the, or the, the first fault span, if I remove this transition, 
all I need to do, I mean, it, make, it makes more sense to start from this state here and then see what states are reachable from, from this state and then remove them from the fault span um, rather than, you know, computing the whole thing from scratch, okay? So the next step is resolving deadlock states. And this is because we are removing some of the transitions, right? So it is quite possible that um, uh, a state, if we remove all of its outgoing transitions, the state becomes a deadlock state. And since we want to preserve all, all the liveness properties, you know, we have to resolve this deadlock. And this is one of the most interesting steps of the, the algorithm. So let's imagine we have uh, this, uh, uh, the program with the invariant and the fault span. And there exists a computation that starts from the invariant and reaches this deadlock state in the fault span. Now, since we have to make sure that the program always reaches the invariant, right, one way to resolve this deadlock state is to add a recovery transition. Very simple, right? But this is not always the case because this transition itself might be a bad transition. This transition may violate the safety specification. For instance, in the Byzantine agreement problem, uh, a deadlock state is where two processes have different decisions and one of them has finalized, right? Now we can't add a recovery transition that forces a process to change its decision once it has finalized. I mean, that's a violation of the specification. We cannot, you know, force the process to change its decision. So in some cases we can add this kind of recovery transitions. In some cases we can't. In some cases, maybe we cannot add direct recovery to the invariant, but we can add, you know, two-step recovery. And we have observed all these cases in different programs. Now, these are the nice uh, cases of deadlock states. Another case is where starting from the invariant, we can reach a deadlock state by faults only. Now, since we don't have any control over the occurrence of faults, the only way to resolve this deadlock state is basically by removing this state from the invariant, right? Now, the most interesting case is this one. It's the case that we reach a deadlock state by a combination of faults and program transitions, such as the, the black state up here. So, if it is not possible to add recovery, and since it is not reached by faults only, we cannot remove this state, and we cannot add recovery. So we have no other choice but to make this state, the black one, unreachable. So why, why can't this, uh, the black uh, state in the invariant be removed? Because, I mean, we can, uh, although uh, you can continue with, uh, with normal the first one is still a port sorry. well there are there could be two reasons the first reason is first of all as I said um, uh, we want to keep the program transitions as much as possible and remember when you if you rem if you remove this uh, state yes you have to remove all the incoming transitions okay and when you remove a transition you have to remove the group of transitions I just uh, don't understand what's the difference with the previous case. Like the previous case you had. Oh, this one? Yes. So in this case, the deadlock state is reached by faults only. Yeah, but uh, isn't it the same thing if you do it by a fault or a fault and the normal step? Okay. It's still a fault, right? Well, if, it, if this is only faults, we have no other choice but to remove this state. Okay. Right, because we don't have any control over the occurrence of faults. Okay. However, if we have this case, there is a, yes, we can always remove this one, but you know, we, we tend to remove things uh, okay, so as less as possible. So you just can remove S1, for example, or something like this. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So what we are going to do is, first we want to make this unreachable, right? Okay. And to make this unreachable, we remove this program transition. Uh, maybe I should have. We remove this program transition. Now, S1 becomes deadlock, and then we have to remove S0, S1, right? 
So the solution, the final solution would uh, remove S0, S1, and that means S1 would be unreachable too, and this would be the final solution, right? The fault occurs, we go to S0, P, and back to the invariant. Something that, that sort of I've been thinking of for a while is, is what, you know, how, what, what are the properties of the underlying program, or how, they, how do you make sure that the behavior is conserved these transformations. Basically, we want uh, the program there is some functional behavior of the program. Right. And now you transform it uh, for a different reason, but at the same time, obviously, there is a purpose for the program to compute something or right. you know, behaves in some sense. So how do you, what's your ideas about keeping that semantics or mm -hmm. properties? Okay, so there are a couple of answers to your question. The first one is, when we add this sort of recovery back to the invariant, when the program reaches its invariant, um, it's back to its normal behavior, right? However, there might, I mean, the synthesized program might have less states in the invariant and less number of transitions. Now, if your question is about CTL properties, the existential properties, if we remove a transition that participates in satisfaction of an existential property, we might violate that. So the sort of properties that we preserve during our synthesis are the universally quantified properties or you know, the LTL type of properties. Um, now, one good question is how we can preserve the CTL properties. Um, I have no answer to that question. I mean, I, I haven't even worked, worked on that. But the thing is, if we want to preserve the CTL properties, we have to have them. Whereas in this case, you know, since we are focusing on you know, LTL type of properties, we don't have to have them to, in order to prove that the synthesized program continues to satisfy the properties of the, the given program. But of course, uh, I was also thinking of the aspect that, that we, you you may have sort of properties that are perhaps not even expressible or sort of in the program which, which when you transform, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, your properties that you preserve don't capture. Mm -hmm. and, and in that sense, you're sort of messing up the program. But like in the traffic lights, you just transform it so that it always has red lights on, on both. Right. Well, in the in the traffic light uh, example, I didn't show I didn't show uh, you know how what, what the synthesized program looked like. But it could be right. So you, you remove the possibly bad transitions, and you end up with the with the traffic light controller, which satisfies that. It, uh, I mean, there is never like two greens at the same time, but but this just means that it's always keeping. Well, that's a, that that's actually what we want to do in that in the traffic controller. We, we don't want to have a state where both are green. Yeah, sure, but uh, this, this can mean that it will remove transition from red to green altogether, and you will just have red on all the time in the synthesized program. Well, uh, so let me answer your, your comment in this way. Uh, yes, that could be possible. Yes, we can, we can end up with a program that has uh, you know less functionality and is basically meaningless right so, something like what you said that um, you know uh, the only possible state is where both signals are red and nothing becomes green yes it is possible well in that particular example that doesn't happen right uh, if you're asking whether this is possible yes it is possible and in fact even worse than that, it is possible that we remove, you know, all the states in the invariant, and we end up with an empty invariant. And in this case, we, we say that the, the algorithm failed to synthesize the program. But at the same time, this is, this is a nice feature about the algorithm, which is the algorithms are sound and complete. So the completeness of the algorithm, you know, sometimes we ignore completeness of algorithms, but in this case, Completeness is, um, how should I say that? Completeness is um, desirable. But you just said that uh, you can, the synthesis can fail, right? You can. Okay. Exactly. So, yes. 
if it fails, that means this program as it is, is not fixable. Because the algorithm is complete and that means there is no other solution that satisfies the, the, the conditions of our problem statement. This is the beauty of completeness, right? So if we end up with an empty invariant, that means the program as it is cannot be fixed. And therefore, a more comprehensive approach should be taken, such as you know, synthesis from specification. So the, the problem that we are addressing is you know, whether the program as it is inside its state space by adding no new variables is fixable. So, in what respect it's complete? It's complete. It's, com it's complete in the sense that if there exists a solution. Yeah, but the solution is basically, I mean, it has to follow the same lines, like it cannot introduce new variables. And, and so right. Because I, I can. Well, well, I guess it's not inherently so, complete. I mean, there is okay, some program right. that someone could write that would Sure, yeah. sure. I mean, it is complete in the sense that it uh, satisfies the conditions of the synthesis problem that I introduced, mm -hmm. right? Now, however, uh, this is, uh, I mean, what I'm, in, uh, what I'm describing here is actually not complete uh, for fault tolerance. The algorithms for leads to, adding leads to, those were complete. This one is not complete. The original problem, because the original problem is NP-complete, addition of fault tolerance to distributed programs. Uh, because of all these groupings. Um, these are heuristics. These are not, they, they are sound, they are not complete. So um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, um, you know, although the, the problem statement is very restricted, but uh, we still have cases where we have to deal with, uh, you know, heuristics, which are not complete. But in the, some other cases, uh, where the, uh, you know, we can devise sound and complete algorithms in polynomial time, then if uh, the algorithm fails to synthesize a program, that means the, the program as it is is not uh, fixable. Okay, so after resolving deadlock states, uh, we recompute the invariant because you know, we might remove some states from the invariant and uh, we keep doing the whole loop until we reach a fixed point. Uh, and uh, when we reach a fixed point, that's the end of the application of heuristics. So let me talk about the experimental results a little bit. <coughs> um, uh, we have implemented the heuristics in C++ using the, the CUDD um, BDD package. Um, the, here the, the, the tool is called SciCraft, which can be downloaded uh, from this address. Um, so the engine of SciCraft is basically the heuristics that I just uh, presented. So let's look at the, the first uh, graph. This is the total synthesis time uh, versus the number of processes of uh, Byzantine agreement, which is this graph, and token ring, which is a mutual exclusion algorithm in a distributed system. Um, so as you can see, for you know, less than five num uh, number of processes, we can synthesize programs in, you know, in the order of milliseconds. And as we increase the number of processes, we can, either, we can go to you know, uh, a few hours. Uh, this is in log scale. Now, the, sec the, the next graph. So and as you can see, the, you know, the token ring problem has a much nicer um, time complexity than uh, the Byzantine agreement. And this is basically due to the complexity of structure of uh, the Byzantine agreement prog uh, program. The next graph is, it's one of my favorite graphs, which is uh, the amount of time that we, have, we had to spend to resolve deadlock states. So if you compare these two, the graph for uh, synthesizing Byzantine agreement uh, for resolving deadlock states is very much like the total of synthesis time, right? So this means uh, most of the time for synthesizing Byzantine agreement was spent to resolve the deadlock states. And in fact, you know, the numbers shows that uh, almost 93% of the time was uh, spent to resolve the deadlock states. 
Whereas in token ring, um, uh, you know, the, the level of this graph uh, is much lower than the original one, the total synthesis time. That means that the time is being, being spent, you know, somewhere else in the case of token ring. You know, this, these are the things that, you know, uh, in model checking we observe them depending upon the structure of the program. Sometimes, you know, we can verify the program. We can find the error states in, you know, shallow parts of the state space. Sometimes, you know, we have to go very deep inside the program. And for the, uh, for, for instance, for the ones that we can uh, discover the errors in, in shallow levels of the state space, you know, bounded model checking tends to be uh, better than uh, the cases that, you know, error is deep inside the state space. So, you know, we are observing sort of the same behavior here. Um, you know, if the structure of the program is such that, you know, we have to resolve a lot of deadlock states that then, then the time is spent there. Uh, in, in case of token ring, that most of the time is spent to compute the fault span, uh, which is basically a reachability problem. I'm not worried about that. You know, we can always apply, uh, you know, tons of methods that are there in model checking to compute the reachable states. Uh, however, this one is a new problem. It's, it's not a problem that was uh, observed in model checking. So um, these results are actually from almost a year ago. Um, for instance, uh, in case of 25 processes, it used to take uh, seven hours to synthesize a program. Now we can uh, synthesize programs uh, with uh, 25 processes, uh, I mean in the context of Byzantine agreement, in almost 10 minutes. So, uh, you know, we have done a lot of optimization and, you know, we have changed the heuristics a little bit. But um, I decided to go with this one to show, you know, where the bottleneck is. Um, in terms of memory, um, so as you can see, in the case of Byzantine agreement, we almost have a linear uh, behavior here. Uh, it's basically because the whole state space, the entire state space of Byzantine agreement is not reachable. Whereas in token ring, that's not the case. So as you can see, um, if we add the number of processes, uh, token ring is going to catch up with Byzantine agreement pretty soon. Uh, and again, in the case of token ring, uh, you know, I applied some of the transition partitioning methods from model checking and you know, we have uh, better results. This is how the synthesized program looks like. Uh, this is basically the output of our tool applied on three processes for Byzantine agreement. So the tool uh, in the first section, it shows which actions of the um, given program are unchanged during the whole course of synthesis. So this is the action that a uh, non-general process basically copies the value from the general. And it is unchanged. It is as it is in the intolerant program. However, the second action um, is revised. And the second action was the one that um, if a process is not undecided and not finalized, it can go ahead and finalize. Now, as you can see, um, that action is now split to four actions. And it has more restrictions uh, to finalize a decision. So this revision basically um, guarantees that we either, that the program does not uh, violate the safety specification. Uh, that's one guarantee. The other one is uh, the program does not reach a deadlock state. Okay. And the third section of the output is new recovery actions. So these are the actions that we sometimes we add from a deadlock state back to the invariant. Okay. Um, this is the output of the tool and some lessons that we learned. Um, the issue of incomplete specification is, is very real. Now, why I'm saying that, the reason is uh, we conducted a couple of case studies. One of them was, was for the NRL, uh, Naval Research Lab Laboratory. Uh, so they gave us a program with a specification. Uh, we synthesized a fault-tolerant program. And, uh, you know, we sent the tolerant program to, to our colleague in, in the NRL. And she said, no, but this is not what we wanted. Um, you know, you are adding these recovery transitions which are not acceptable. And then when we went back to the specification, we found out that 
well, those transitions were not ruled out in the specification. And that's why the synthesis tool added them. So the, basically what they wanted is if something bad happens, the program should go back to the initial state. That, that's the sort of recovery that was accept, acceptable to them. But what we synthesized was uh, if something bad happens, you can go back to the invariant, which is, which is fine. Um, so, and we, we have observed this in, in some other case. In, in the traffic controller, we have seen this. Uh, for instance, uh, if we don't rule out the transitions that uh, a signal can go from uh, red to yellow, if we don't rule them out, the synthesis tool, you know, it adds them. Uh, we have also observed this in other cases. For instance, in the alternate bit protocol, um, if you don't rule out, you know, the, the sort of you know, non-acceptable, unacceptable uh, transitions, we can uh, we we can synthesize a program where the sender sends an acknowledgement on behalf of the receiver, right? So, um, you know, we, we have to be very careful in terms of uh, uh, incomplete specification. And actually, since we observed this uh, in most of the case studies that we, we, we conducted, uh, we thought maybe we can use our tool to basically discover the missing specifications. And uh, we, we, we are planning to work on that. Uh, the, the second thing was by focusing on specific properties, specific domains, specific programs, I think it is feasible to uh, use you know, synthesis techniques in practice. Um, you know, because of the, the, the experimental results that we have, we have gotten so far, um, uh, you know, I, I think it is possible to synthesize programs in, in, in practice. Um, the, the next one is uh, I think I talked about the, the diverse possible set of solutions when I was uh, describing this. And uh, the, 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 the notion that we are you know, uh, focusing on specific properties, uh, we know what the property is, and we know where the property can be violated, under what conditions. And then we don't have to you know, translate the property to a BUK automata and then, you know, uh, then, then uh, compute the, the, the deterministic BUK automata, which, is, which makes a mess out of the state space. Um, so we could avoid the determinization problems here. In terms of future work, um, we are planning to apply some of the model checking techniques in, in the context of synthesis. Some of them can be applied trivially, such as you know, reachability analysis. Uh, some of them cannot be applied trivially, such as you know, abstraction refinement. And this is because you know, since we are dealing with adding, removing transitions, adding, removing states, if we abstract a state predicate uh, in which we have to remove a state or, in we, or from where you know, we have to remove or add transitions, uh, you know, I'm not sure how we can, we can do that. So, um, it, it, it needs work. Um, uh, we are planning to develop some SAT or QBF-based techniques. Um, distributed parallel model checking. We have done some work in this area um, to you know, parallelize um, the synthesis algorithms. And uh, we have had some pretty good results too. Uh, we want to add just the notion of multi-tolerance instead of fault tolerance in which we, we basically, um, uh, a program provides a different level of tolerance with respect to each class of faults. Uh, we want to work on additional fault tolerance to hybrid systems where uh, programs have both continuous and um, uh, discrete variables. And uh, I think that that would be the core of a, a formalism for what is so-called you know, the cyber physical systems now. Uh, there is you know, some thoughts on using epistemic logic to synthesize uh, protocols with multiple concerns and we would like to use some graph mining and machine learning um, techniques to synthesize programs. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. Any questions? Mm -hmm. 
but I think in, in general you, you cannot concentrate it. Well, in in some cases we can, you know, preserve the functionality. For instance, in in for LTL specifications, right? For CTL specifications, we think we should have the property. Otherwise, there is no way to to guarantee that you know the synthesized program satisfies that property. Uh, you know, since we we add or remove some transitions, you know, we have we should have the property to analyze that whether the removal of this transition is uh, uh, you know violate that property. Now, in terms of semantics, I think it's a very good question. I think it's a very good research direction um, to sort of you know how we can guarantee that you know sp uh, specific properties or specific functionalities are preserved when we synthesize programs. So one of the things that sort of comes to my mind is connection is well the semantics of a program chain is a set of set of transitions but uh, the description of those semantics is implicit. I mean the program is just symbolic, you know right. One single statement in your in your program may correspond to a different number of positions. Right. right. So when you just synthesize, <coughs> you want to change it, say, to eliminate one couple of those, you sort of need to change it symbolically, right. rather than explicitly. Like you don't have transition go from three to four. Okay, I remove it. Rather, there is an assignment that combines values and you know adds things together, and then results in such a transition. Mm -hmm. How to remove it would be, mm -hmm. uh, would be hard. I think uh, something that might answer your question is um, the sort of specifications where, uh, I mean, safety specifications that can be captured by a set of prefixes rather than one single transition. Because what we are just saying that uh, it depends on you know how we reach a state, not by re so, so reachability of a state is not important. The, the important thing is how, how we reach that state. If we reach, um, if uh, let's say uh, three consecutive assignments is not acceptable, that, that is a sort of safety specification that can be modeled by a prefix rather than a transition. And you know, we have shown that uh, you know, this kind of safety specification uh, adds to the complexity of the problem. And in, par in particular, for length of three, we have shown that the problem is incomplete. Um, but, you know, as I said, I think it's a it's a it's a very good uh, research direction to to address this problem. Safety properties would be safe to just uh, remove all transitions. That's it. Well, not then, then the program is safe. All, all the transitions of the program? Yeah, or? basically you Yeah, I mean, if you, if you end up with an empty program, yeah, yeah that satisfies, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a trivial property, it satisfies everything. Yeah. But um, as I said, um, when we design our algorithms, uh, we, our criteria is to keep the program transitions as much as possible, and states. Yeah, sure, that's the reasonable thing to Right. Do. Just but I guess to keep the functionality without to have some functional specifications also. Sure. Yeah, yeah definitely absolutely that to make things work. So. Right. Yeah, I, I look at this work as you know an initiative yeah, it's for bigger research problems. Um, it's quite interesting. What we have been dealing with are you know a bunch of you know toy examples. Um, but uh, you know we have to expand it to more you know to, to real world examples to see where our algorithms are going to fail, um, and you know what are the functionalities that uh, the algorithms do not preserve that has to be preserved. But is it is it somehow related to this uh, dynamic typing thing, uh, like where uh, you have dynamic type programs and then you uh, add some runtime checks, for example? Mm -hmm. So that for, for places where you're not sure if the safe safe thing is done, right. then then you add some, some checks right. some checks there. Right. So I guess this is also some, some sure. Different. Yeah, absolutely. So the I think our intuition has been a, a top down, uh, sorry, a, a bottom up approach. 
So we first we wanted to identify the cases, the most restrictive cases that we can do synthesis in, let's say, polynomial time. And uh, you know, even by and the cases where by imposing all those constraints, we can. Um, I mean, the the problem is hard. And then you know, develop some heuristics, and you know, then expand the theory. For instance, one of the things that we don't uh, address in our current framework is synchronization. Right? I mean, our transitions are not labeled. Um, so that that would be another step. Um, there. Are, this is the sad thing that the more I, I work in the area, the more problems I discover. <laughs> You know, rather than when you work, you know, more in the area, you solve more problems. You know, you, we solve problems, uh, but you know, we, we discover more problems too. Okay, so if there are more questions, then let's thank you also again. Thank you.